Accessible Gaming with Ross Miner. So my name is Ross Miner. I am totally blind and I am a digital accessibility consultant with a specialty in video games. I sort of got my start on YouTube and I still upload videos to my YouTube channel basically surrounding uh, video games and you know what games can you play while you're blind and I stream video games and pretty much do all sorts of advocacy and that's kind of translated into uh, consulting now for game studios and they basically come to me and say hey how can we make XYZ feature accessible for blind people in our video game. What do you do as an accessibility consultant for video games? I sort of lean into the design side. Um, so a lot of the times either a company will come to me with a game that they've already created and say, how, how can we make this accessible for blind people? Or they'll come to me before they even created the game and want to build it from the ground up. Um, and so if a company has already created the game, a lot of it is writing reports and quality assurance and kind of suggesting things. And, you know, maybe they'll circle back with me in a period of time to kind of gauge progress on their prototypes and things like that. Um, but then building from the ground up is definitely a lot more uh, of an involved process where you kind of work hands on and you have you're really able to like get down into the nitty gritty of like what this feature should look like to best serve the game that it's going to be working in. But it's still very much design focused and very, very creative. And that's that's what I really love um, about working with game developers is that like we we're both just on the same wavelength. We're like, oh, what if we did this? What if we did this? Like there's in terms of accessible gaming, there's just so much to be done. Uh, the possibilities are absolutely endless. Um, and so, yeah, it's really great to kind of just get in there, brainstorm and uh, come up with just really, really cool features because, you know, even if it's the same same genre of a game, there could be two different, totally different accessibility features that uh, make the game blind accessible. You know, that's kind of like a core philosophy of accessibility is that there's no one size fits all. There's no one solution that will work for everyone. So it, it at the end of the day, it all depends on the game specifically. If you're a game developer, what are the top three things you should be adding to your game to make it accessible to blind players? I would say that there are three things that can um, make a game, you know, mostly, if not completely blind accessible. And that is text-to-speech, sound cues, and navigation assistance. Um, and many times you don't always need all three to at least make the game playable, but you need all three to make it completely accessible. Um, and then first being text-to-speech, what I mean by this is a screen reader or a, a synthesizer reading all the text that there is on the screen. So navigating through the menus, being able to read all the settings and options, but also importantly, reading text in game, whether it's, uh, you know, um, like a new area where, you know, if you enter a new area, it'll, it'll bring up like a caption saying what area you're in, like read that out or, uh, you know, have TTS read what your health is and uh, knowing what skills you have or what armor or weapons you have, like it, the possibilities are endless. And so that's what I mean by TTS. And then navigation assistance, what I mean by that is having some sort of way to tell the blind player where they're supposed to go in the game or not even where they're supposed to go, but just what obstacles are in the way. Um, because without that, it makes you know a lot of 3D environments very, very difficult to navigate. And so uh, to give an example of this uh, is famously The Last of Us, part one and two. Um, these games can be completed entirely from beginning to end without sight whatsoever. You need zero help from a sighted person at all. Um, and the way the navigation assistance uh, primarily works is that it, it's sort of like a, a golden path, I like to call it where um, you press a button and uh, it will point you in the right direction and you basically work your way along these nodes so to say so you press a button you walk and eventually you'll hear like a, a like a, a sound effect indicating that you need to press the button again to like recenter yourself and so you kind of keep doing that uh, like hear the sound press hear the sound press and so it moves you along the path along the objective um, through the game. And right now, you know, that's that's the best we have for navigation assistance in a 3D environment. Um, one of my dreams is to definitely help 
create navigation assistance in an open world environment. I think that's the next big goal. Um, because right now, like the quote unquote golden path doesn't give a ton of agency in uh, where you want to go. You, you're kind of just being led a bit, but it's still a massive, massive improvement to anything that has come before it. Um, and so that, that's kind of the gist of navigation assistance. And it can come in many different forms, um, depending on the type of game. Um, and then lastly, sound effects. I think sound effects are a great way to let the user know uh, when certain things happen without having to listen to the TTS talking to you nonstop because that can get very, very overwhelming. Um, and so having uh, information be presented in that way is uh, really important. And a good example of this is in uh, God of War Ragnarok. Um, there are sound effects for when you need to dodge, when you need to parry, when you need to uh, shield break, you know, all, all those sorts of things. And it's it's really cool to kind of just hear those in the middle of combat and like being able to fluidly uh, just just fight like a sighted person. Um, and again, yeah, like sound effects can be used for for different things to represent certain things. Like earlier I said, oh, you can have Texas speech read you the health. Well, you can also have a sound effect tell you what your health is at. Um, and that's where you can get really, really creative with it. For, for uh, blind people who have some sight, uh, I would throw in, you know, things like color contrast, color blindness, uh, text scaling, things like that. Um, those are really, really important. What are some common misconceptions people have about blind gaming? Really, I feel that most misconceptions these days come from non-blind gamers. Blind gamers want to believe that any game can be playable. Uh, blind gamers want to play those games. I see it all the time. Like, oh, I wish I could play this classic game. I wish I could play this upcoming game. Um, just all the time, every single day. From many sighted people, there is definitely a vocal minority of people who say that uh, accessibility overall, quote unquote, dumbs down a game, which uh, there's a saying, uh, in the accessibility space that accessible design is good design because like i said accessibility doesn't only benefit the target demographic it benefits people outside of that um so like navigation assistance that that can help people who are getting lost audio descriptions of video games if they have to look away from the screen for a second they'll still know what's happening uh closed captions if uh you know they're playing and they have to keep the volume down they can still read the dialogue just all these things like that and so there's definitely a misconception that, you know, people say, oh, developers shouldn't be focusing on accessibility. They should be focusing on this feature in the game when in reality, those are two different teams. So there's an accessibility team and then there's a design team and, all, you know, all that stuff. I mean, you can point to so many features that would be called accessibility features back in the day, but are now just standard captions and subtitles. That's pretty standard volume sliders. That's pretty standard uh, motion blur. Things like that are are pretty standard these days uh, that people don't really think of as accessibility features. So, I mean, even, you know, while playing a video game, uh, like having a map in the corner of the screen, that's an accessibility feature. Like a lot of it is about perspective. If you just shift the way you think about things, you're like, oh, wow, this can really help a large demographic of people. What are some of your favorite games from both an accessibility standpoint and just for general gameplay reasons? Oh, yeah. I mean, I could talk about this for a long time. Um, so for anyone who can't see me, I have a Pokemon tattoo on my right arm. Um, so Pokemon is, ob is an obvious one. Um, the newer games are actually not accessible anymore, but it still holds like a very fond place in my heart just because I loved Pokemon before I went blind. And after I was blinded, I wanted to keep playing that. And Pokemon allowed me to do that, allowed me to socially engage with uh, other kids my age uh, at the peak of Pokemon when it was really, really popular. But these days, I mean, my my favorite games shift all the time, but right now it's absolutely Forza Motorsport. Uh, this came out in October and it is the very first racing game that is accessible for blind people. So blind people can literally drive a car in a video game now, which is just revolutionary, historic, incredible, uh, like just 
so much creativity and ingenuity went into this. Just it, it's it's incredible. Furthermore, though, uh, Forza Motorsport and I I uh, <laughs> got roasted on my YouTube channel for uh, messing up the terminology, so I may do that again. But uh, it's a simulation uh, racing game, so it's meant to simulate the sounds and the physics of a real car, which means you can hook up a wheel and pedal and a chair, like an entire racing rig to literally drive a car and blind people can actually do that. Um, but besides Forza Motorsport, honestly, like any game that has accessibility, I love like I, the more accessible games that come out, uh, the more I like find myself just rotating between a bunch of them. Let's see what else is there. Um, oh yeah. Uh, As Dusk Falls, that's a, a kind of like a choose your own adventure game. I actually uh, consulted on that to help add audio description to it. Or As Dusk Falls is already out and it has a screen reader and it's already accessible in, in that regard. But in March, it's going to come out on all platforms. So PlayStation, uh, Switch, and it will have audio description as well. How do mods factor into accessible gaming? What mods are um, is let's say a game has been released. Well, developers, uh, just not related to the game studio, just like hobby hobbyists, will uh, create a mod. And what it does is um, it's code that will like change a feature of the game. And so people will add like new designs, new functionality. Well, that's what accessibility mod does is add new functionality. And so there have been just over the years, a growing number of blind gamers who have been advocating, who have been reaching out to developers like, hey, can you make this mod accessible or can make this game accessible with the mod? And because of that, there have been so many games um, that blind people thought they've never been able to play, but can now. These are just independent, uh, your average Joe, just people doing this for fun, doing this as a hobby. Uh, so they don't get paid. Really the only benefit they get is just knowing that they helped out the blind community. Um, so it, yeah, it really is just blind people, sighted people, really anyone who's just wants to make a difference, you know, it's not easy to create a mod either. So just, you know, shout out to all the developers that do that because, uh, it, I know it means the world to me and a lot of other blind people. To learn more about Ross Miner and his work, visit his website, rossminer.com.